Well, I think it's already 10 and uh, we should, uh, already 11, we should get started. Okay. Um, so this class, we're going to uh, enter a new chapter uh, that is the wastewater treatment. So if you recall, we have what we have already learned, right? So the first quarter, we mainly talk about the um, general chemical concepts, right? And then for the second quarter, uh, or which is the exam that you just had, right? So that is about the general water quality and how we treat the drinking water. So that's a water treatment process. So the, here we are at the third quarter, all right? So, um, so here is the, here we are at the third quarter and that is the wastewater treatment. And in the final quarter, we're going to talk about the air pollution and the um, solid waste management processes. Okay, so if we do a quick recap of our last class, right? So last class, we mainly talk about the um, we mainly talk about the water treatment, right? So that can involve quite many steps. For example, the screening, the coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, sand filtration, disinfection. So these are for the surface water treatment, and then for the underground water treatment, right? We are going to include the softening process. Uh, which basically to convert those hardness ions into um, basically the mass of the sodium chloride that we're going to need to treat these water. Okay, so this is about the drinking water. So what about the wastewater, right? So we know that wastewater generally has, is more polluted than the sources of, of the water that we uh, extract for drinking water, right? For example, drinking water, we could use lake or river water or use underground water. So generally those water sources are very clean, but the wastewater can have a very high concentration of the, those pollutants. But on the other hand, we also don't need a very stringent requirements regarding the wastewater treatment because water treatment, like drinking water treatment, this is for drinking, right? So we need to make sure that almost all of the chemicals are removed. We just have uh, basically H2O in the water, right? But for the wastewater treatment, we don't need to be that stringent because uh, if we can treat it moderately, right, until the concentration of those pollutants becomes lower, right, the BOD becomes lower, right, they can mix with the natural system and further we could let our ecosystem to treat the remaining of the pollutants. So these are the two major differences, right? So for drinking water treatment, um, they generally need very clean sources, right? We need a lot of steps. But for the wastewater treatment, uh, we're talking about very polluted water, right? And also the treatment can be more simplified. Um, so this is what we have learned. And uh, before we knew, learn the new contents, I'm quite curious about how you feel about the second exam. Okay, so I'm gonna launch a pool for you to fill in, okay? So what do you think of the second exam? <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, it seems that all of you, yeah, all of you have uh, answered that. Okay, and it share the results. So um, I think this is type of uh, exam that we, we want to have, right? So uh, if most of you feel that it's reasonable, um, yeah, I think that's good. I'll take a look at the final score. Um, so um, I'll let you know. So normally we want to make sure that the average is at least above 20, right? Because the total, the total score is 30, right? So uh, we'll, we'll find out. But normally I, I feel that once we enter these uh, uh, more engineering aspects of the uh, environmental systems, you guys will do better than the um, basic chemical concepts, okay? Um, so I think I saw a chat. Um, from Madeline, but um, yeah, we can chat later on after the class, okay? Um, so this is the um, what we learned in our last class, right? So regarding the uh, wastewater treatment, um, so we'll first talk about the general concept, uh, general uh, properties of these uh, wastewater, especially the municipal wastewater. So municipal wastewater are mainly talking about the wastewater coming out of households, right? From your toilet, from your sink, right, from like general residential buildings, right? So uh, we'll first discuss their 
uh, physical properties. So physical properties are, are mainly talking about their color, their smell, their temperature, and so on. So for example, for these uh, municipal wastewater, their color can be gray or dark gray. Uh, this makes sense because we never seen any wastewater that can be very clear, right? Uh, so odor is nasty, that's for sure, right? Temperature is generally 10 to 20 Celsius. That's mainly because it's coming from the residential area. And then uh, in terms of solids, people are quite interested in the solid the water because um, before we dump it directly into the ecosystem, we need to treat the solids, right? Because solids are difficult to react with, right? If it's organic solids, right? Then uh, it's going to stay in the ecosystem for a long time. So that's why people measure what is the mass concentration of these solids. So in terms of the total concentration, it's uh, generally 500 milligram per liter, right? So, um, um, so for this total uh, concentration or for this total solids, it not only includes like the suspended particles or sands in there, but also the salts, okay? So this is what you get after you um, evaporate all of the water in the wastewater, okay? So this is also going to contain some salts in there. But we also know that in the wastewater, there can be particulate inside, basically particle inside. So uh, the way we measure that is to basically filter the particle, filter the, the wastewater, right? See how much mass is left on the filter paper, right? That turns out to be around half of the total solid in the wastewater. So that's around 250 milligrams, right? Now further for these particulate or for these particles, um, half of it are settleable, right? So if you place it, um, in the environment for a long time, then half of the solids can, can settle down to the, to, to the base of the, uh, either the river or the lake. But still we have 125 milligram per, per liter of the particles that are non-settleable, right? So th for those, we call them as colloids. So just to recall what we learned uh, when we talk about the drinking water treatment, right? So for the milk or for those uh, a little bit polluted water, right? So um, you have the suspended solids, right? They carry a similar charge. Their size is too small. And also they're, um, they have the Brownian motion, right? The random motion that they're going to make colloids. So if we are creating colloids in the wastewater, then they're going to be turbid, right? So the light cannot directly transfer through these uh, wastewater in here. Uh, so one thing I want to point out is that for these concentrations, um, they are um, a general range, okay? So there can be higher concentrations, there can be lower concentrations. And generally for this concentration, it uh, represents the medium polluted wastewater, okay? So there's also strongly polluted wastewater and the weakly uh, polluted wastewater. So you can find their properties in here. So basically you have the medium one, this is what we talk about, right? There's also the strong ones and the weak ones, all right? So um, this is about the physical property, right? So what about the chemical properties, right? So chemical properties um, here, we want to know what is the chemical composition, right? What are the contents of the organics in the water, right? For example, people measure the BOD5 of the uh, wastewater. And if we're talking about the medium polluted wastewater, their concentration, the BOD5 concentration is around 200 milligram per liter, okay? So theoretically with the BOD5, you could calculate what is the ultimate BOD. I think you did that calculation in your exam as well, right? So people could also measure the COD, the chemical oxygen demand. So that turns out to be around 500 milligram per liter for the medium polluted wastewater. So here, then uh, since we talk about these concepts again, so I have a question. So what is the correlation? What is the relationship? between BOD and COD. This is what we learned in our, um, uh, in our drinking water treatment. So this is the second pool that I'm going to launch, okay? So what is the relationship between BOD and COD?
I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, we'll stop here. All right, so most of you got the correct answer. That should be BOD, always smaller than COD, okay? So um, we said that for the BOD, that's a biological oxygen demand, right? COD, that's using some strong oxidizing chemicals to convert those organics into, um, into carbon dioxide and water, right? So we said that the BOD is always lower smaller than COD, mainly because um, for the uh, organics in the water. So on the first hand, um, if there is plastic, right? Plastic bottle in the water, right? So the, the microorganisms are not going to use them, right? So even if you are talking about, let's say for pure sugar water, right? For pure sugar water, the uh, microorganisms in the water is not going to completely convert those sugar into carbon dioxide and water, mainly because they're also storing some of the orga organics into their body, right? To synthesize, let's say, fat or, or the protein, right, inside. So there, there is not a complete conversion. And at the same time, for the waste that's generated by the microorganisms, it's not pure um, carbon dioxide and water either, right? So because of that, the COD is always smaller. Uh, the BOD is always smaller than COD. So there's no scenario that these two are equal uh, to each other, right? Um, so apart from the BOD and COD, people will also care about the nitrogen and phosphorus inside because as we know, uh, these species are basically nutrients in the water. So they can lead to, let's say the algae bloom, right? And once we have the algae bloom, it's going to kill all the living species in the water that's creating the dead zone, right? So in terms of the nitrogen in the wastewater, um, generally uh, they're existing in the organic and ammonium nitrogen, okay? And their concentration is around 40 milligram per liter. And these nitrogen species together with organic species they are going to exist as the oxygen demand, right? And then they can also um, provide nutrition uh, to the water. So we could have some um, furthermore pollution cases like the algal bloom, right? And then for the phosphorus, they can exist in the form of uh, orthophosphates, polyphosphates, and organic phosphate. And their con concentration is generally around 10 milligram per liter. So normally we, we see these phosphates from our um, like dishwashers, okay? or the, um, basically the detergents, they will contain these species, right? So once we dump them into the wastewater, they can serve as the uh, nutrition or the nutrient for those, um, um, for those algae, right? And people could also measure the total organic carbon, right? So that turns out to be around uh, 50 milligram per liter, okay? So there can be organic carbon, there can be inorganic carbon. So inorganic carbons are mainly, let's say, um, the carbonate species, right? So the carbonic acid, bicarbonate, and carbon, car uh, carbonic ions, right? So here we're talking about the uh, organic carbon in the wastewater. Um, so further, here is a table that's um, basically um, um, showing you all different types of wastewater. So we were mainly discussing the medium polluted uh, wastewater, right? So it's, as you can see, the BOD is around 200, right? That we're showing here, around 200. The COD is around 500. So for the strong ones, uh, the COD and BOD can be, uh, can reach to a thousand, right? So BOD can be even higher. For the weaker ones, the BOD is lower, right? Suspended solids, it's the same, right? So this is talking about the municipal wastewater, right? So it's also called the domestic wastewater. Uh, basically coming from the residential area. So what about the industry, right? So industry is generating a lot of uh, polluted wastewater, right? So because of that, their BOD can be extremely high. So here in this table, we're listing several industries, right? For example, the ammunition, the fermentation, slaughterhouse, right? Pulp and paper, tannery, that's for producing the leather, right? So fermentation, one example for the fermentation can be the beer industry, right? So 
we know that the, the Budweiser is in St. Louis, right? I'm not sure if you guys visited their, um, their, their plant before, right? So they're going to require a lot of uh, um, uh, basically crops, right? And then go through the fermentation process. And in the wastewater, it's going to contain a lot of the organics. So because of that, if you see the BOD, right, this is 4,500 for BOD5, which is uh, way higher than the uh, municipal wastewater BOD5, right? If you compare here, it's 200, this is 4,500, right? The suspended solids in the wastewater can also be very high, right? The same for the slaughter slaughterhouse and tannery because these two are dealing with the with the poultry or the meat, right? So we know that the meat contains a lot of organics inside. It's mainly protein inside, right? So because of that, the BOD can also be very high. But if you compare these industries against the ammunition and the uh, pulp and paper, right? So the BOD5 can be very low. And this is mainly because the source um, of the, of the uh, ingredients that we use doesn't contain a lot of organics inside, right? And because of that, for different industries, they're going to have a large variety of the BOD and the suspended solids we're going to deal with. And that's why the EPA regulates that for these different industries, they have to treat their wastewater first before they send their wastewater into the, let's say the municipal wastewater treatment plant or, or, or more centralized treatment plants, okay? So generally in these industries, they're going to have their own a wastewater treatment facilities to first uh, do some primary treatment of these uh, wastewater, okay? So these are the general properties of the wastewater. Um, so what about regulation? Um, so further, this is a, uh, before we talk about the regulation, this is uh, more, um, I would say, um, uh, categories that's posed by the EPA regarding different types of pollutants, right? So um, for example, the conventional ones, but the conventional pollutants that's uh, listed by the EPA include BOD5, the total suspended solids, oil, right, pH. So the non-conventional ones or the newer ones will include some metals, uh, ammonia, fluoride, right, and then phosphorus, total organic carbon. So these are the newer ones, right? And uh, uh, I think EPA is doing a very good job listing all the, um, let's say the pollutants that people are going to deal with, okay? So here you can see there is a, a total of, uh, of 126 species of these uh, chemicals that the EPA is interested in, okay? So the EPA is going to do routine measurements to make sure that there's a low or, or a uh, adequate concentration of these pollutants, right? So that they don't go above the uh, limit so you can see that here, there can be a lot of uh, metals, right? Chromium, copper, lead, mercury, nickel, and so on, right? Silver and so on. Um, so basically we will regulate all of these um, different species in our wastewater so that they're not over the limit and further damage the ecosystem. Um, so th these are the general properties of the, EP uh, of the uh, wastewater, right? So what about the standards? Okay, so... Uh, how should we, uh, how do we know that our treatment is sufficient, right, for the, uh, either the municipal wastewater or the industrial wastewater, okay? So if you recall for the drinking water treatment, right, so the, uh, in the drinking water treatment, we talk about these two limits, right? Um, so basically we have the MCL and MCLG, right? MCL stands for maximum contaminant level, right? So basically, uh, the EPA regulates that for the drinking water, um, the contaminants in the water cannot be higher than these MCL levels, right? That's a maximum maximum contaminant level. So similarly for the wastewater, uh, for the wastewater, the federal regulations also has some uh, limits in there, right? So the first thing is that uh, the federal regulation requires that for all the wastewater treatment facilities, we need to contain a secondary treatment. So what does the, what does the secondary treatment mean? Uh, so basically, if you, um, let me just use the pen here. So in a, a wastewater treatment plant, there can be different stages of the treatment, right? So there can be a primary treatment, there can be secondary treatment, there can be tertiary treatment and so on. 
okay? So through each layer of the treatment, the wastewater quality is going to get better and better, okay? So generally for the primary treatment, this just involves screening, right? And also, let's say, letting the particles to settle down, right? So it's similar to a sedimentation basin, okay? So the secondary treatment will involve the process that's dealing with the BOD, right, the BOD out. So the secondary treatment will involve the process that's uh, dealing with the BOD, okay? So what the federal regulation says is that for each wastewater treatment plant, you need to at least have two stages of treatment or it, you have to contain a secondary treatment that deal with BOD, okay? So basically this is our requirement. We need to have the primary treatment and secondary treatment. And regarding the goals that we need to achieve, right? So the BOD five for the, uh, let's say the dumped uh, or the treated wastewater needs to be either 30, 30 or 45 milligram per liter based on different uh, averaging periods, okay? So basically you can treat it, let's say BUD5, if you measure it weekly, right? If you measure the BUD5 concentration weekly over a week, then its concentration has to be lower than 45 milligram per liter, okay? So if you, re if you recall, what is a BUD5 for the general wastewater? You can see that that was generally 100 to 300, right? Depending on which type of wastewater we're talking about. This is the domestic or municipal wastewater. But for the industrial wastewater, this can be very high, right? So we need to lower the BOD5 until its concentration is 45 milligram per liter if we measure it every week, okay? And regarding the suspended solids, right? It's the same, right? So 30 or 45. So basically, if you measure it weekly, then we need to make sure that concentration is always below 45. But if you measure it monthly, we need to make sure that the monthly average is below 30. And the pH for the treated wastewater needs to be six to nine, okay? So here I, ha I have another question. So uh, basically why, uh, let's say the, the EPA had, or the federal regulation give us two standards, okay? So if you measure monthly, right? If you get the monthly average, it needs to be below 30. And if you do the weekly average, it needs to be below 45. So why aren't these two numbers equal, right? So why is monthly average always lower than the weekly average, okay? So the reason to put these two different standards is to consider the fluctuation of these pollutants in the water. So for example, we could have a, let's say a real time monitoring of the BOD, okay? So this is time. This is BOD, okay? So for example, we could measure it through the entire month, right? And this is what we can see. So sometimes you can have very high concentration, sometimes lower, right? This can be the BOD five concentration. And this is over a whole month, right? Entire, entire month. So if you do the average of the entire month uh, regarding BOD five, it can be somewhere here, right? So basically, as long as this average is below 30, it's below 30 milligram per liter, then we know that it satisfies the, the monthly requirement, right? And for the, weekly require, uh, for the weekly measurement, it really depends on when we're doing the weekly uh, measurements, right? So if we do the weekly measurements here, we know that, well, it's definitely below 45. But what if we do the measurements here, right? If we do the weekly me measurements here, then we know that the average is somewhere here, right? It is higher than 30. But still, if this value is below 45, right, we will still say that the wastewater um, basically satisfies the requirements in there, okay? So this is to consider the fluctuation of these pollutants in the wastewater. So that's why for the monthly average or the limit for the monthly average, is lower compared to the limit for the weekly average, okay? Um, so it's the same thing for the suspended solids, right? You're also going to use 30 or 45 milligram per liter for the monthly or weekly average, okay? Uh, so this is the federal requirements. And regarding local requirements, um, it's going to be more stringent, okay? Because it really depends on where we're at, right? For example, 
if there's a uh, industry that, that's just nearby a national park. Right? We know that national park can have a wide range of uh, ecosystems in there. It's also very fragile. So because of that, there can be more regulations onto this industry so that you don't harm the natural environment, right? So we can measure, people will further regulate the ammonia, the total nitrogen, the phosphorus, even the E. coli. So we will count how many bacteria are there before we dump the wastewater or the treated wastewater into the uh, ecosystem, right? And one thing that's for sure is that each treatment plant, plant is going to need a operating permit because that has to be certified. Otherwise, if it's not certified, then, then we, we cannot have the guarantee that the, uh, the, uh, the wastewater satisfies the treatment limits, right? Uh, so basically this is a requirement or uh, this is a goal that's posed regarding the wastewater treatment process, okay? So we have the very polluted wastewater. We have the goals that the EPA gave us. So how do we achieve that, okay? So here I have a short video that basically, uh, that will generally go through the process of the uh, wastewater treatment, okay? So let me just share this uh, video here. We'd rather not think about. Where does last night's dinner go when we flush it down the drain? Well, you may already be grossed out just thinking about it. This question leads way to a significant subset of civil engineering and a massive amount of public funding. Just like all dogs go to heaven, all drains in a city lead to a wastewater treatment plant where that wastewater gets turned back into water that we can drink. Now, you may be thinking that you'd rather just let bygones be bygones and not think about this nasty part of real life. But here's the thing. Chances are you've drunk water that was waste at some point, so you might want to take some time to understand this engineering process that makes dirty water clean. Here's where it starts. The toilet. Once you're done doing your business and flush that magical handle, your waste ends up at the inlet of one pretty interesting place, a wastewater treatment plant. Why is this place so interesting? Because it takes arguably one of the most disgusting substances in the world and turns it back into something that is essential to all life. Flushing just your toilet at halftime may not seem like a big deal, but when you couple it with thousands, if not millions, of others doing the same, it can result in some pretty high sewage flow rates. New York City has an array of 14 wastewater treatment plants that handle a combined 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater daily. That's enough wastewater to fill the Dead Sea with pure sewage in just eight years. And that's just New York City. There are an estimated 14,748 treatment plants in the U.S. alone that 76% of the USA's population relies on, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. Understanding wastewater is crucial to understanding the critical infrastructure needed to support modern life. That brings us to the first step of the process that handles larger items in sewage, things like flushable wipes, 2x4s, toys, or even guns. You name it, and it's probably been caught in a bar screen. Bar screens are exactly what you would think. They are large vertical bars that stand at the inlet of nearly every wastewater treatment plant designed to stop larger items from getting to the plant and hurting machinery like pumps. This first process where bar screens are used is commonly referred to as pretreatment. The sole intention of pretreatment is to remove the outliers in the sewage and make the whole mixture a little more homogenous or slightly less chunky. If you want to eat healthy and feel your best, you gotta try Kachava. Kachava is the Bar screens are typically mechanically raked at certain intervals depending upon the flow rates of the water treatment plant, although some older plants will still have more manual removal processes. Whatever is removed from the bar screens is then sent off to your average landfill or solid waste handling facility. Or, in the case of unusual items such as guns, they're sent off to the evidence locker in a police station to be investigated. Next up is the grit chamber. 
Grit chambers are the next steps in the pretreatment process following bar screens. Since these bars don't catch everything, larger particles called grit still need to be removed from the sewage as it is made even more homogeneous. As the sewage flows into the grit chamber, the velocity of the rather viscous sewage is adjusted to allow for particles of sand and rock to settle out. This is needed because these particles can't be removed using chemicals, and they could potentially clog or destroy pumps later on in the process. There are three types of these chambers chambers, horizontal grit chambers, aerated grit chambers, and vortex grit chambers, which all accomplish the same task using slightly different methods. Following the grit chambers, the sewage will move on to the primary treatment process, which starts with a large basin called a primary clarifier. Primary clarifiers and clarifiers in general function on the principle of settling velocity. This term can be defined simply as the speed at which a particle settles. For wastewater being pumped into clarifiers, it's important that the flow rate of the water being pumped in doesn't exceed the settling velocity of the particles trying to be removed. In order to accomplish this, engineers will vary the size and number of primary clarifiers in accordance with the plant's permitted sewage flow rate. This ensures that at varying flow levels, solids can settle out of primary clarifiers to the correct quantities. At this step in the process, the slightly treated wastewater, which is referred to as effluent, is free of solids larger than 10 micrometers and should be all organic matter, which will be treated further. The top layer of the clarified water flows over a weir wall and into the next basin in the process called the aeration basin. Now begins the process of secondary treatment, the sole focus of which is to significantly degrade the biological content of the sewage. In many cases, this process starts with aeration basins. Effluent flows into the aeration basins, at the bottom of which are hundreds if not thousands of tiny air blowers that create bubbles through the water. The water is pumped into this tank along with something called return activated sludge. You can think of return activated sludge as a bunch of happy little bacteria that get to eat their favorite foods all day long. This introduction of significant amounts of bacteria along with the massive amounts of oxygen injected from the bubblers creates an environment perfect for the process of aerobic digestion. Summarized simply, it's the breakdown of organic matter along with the use of excess oxygen. Some older plants will add in another step before aeration basins, referred to as biofilters or trickling filters. Found in many older plants, these filters essentially trickle the effluent over a medium like stone or plastic and allow for a film of bacteria to chow down on any organic matter in the water. This step is largely not used in newer plants due to more efficient and effective modern processes, but for plants with basins already installed, many still use them because they only benefit the treatment process in most cases. Following aeration basins, the effluent along with much of the sludge is pumped into a secondary filter or clarifier, where some of the sludge is removed and pumped back into the aeration basins as the return activated sludge. Further settling of large larger particles is also accomplished in these basins, as it is the final step of the process that will remove solids and larger biological matter. Water flows out of secondary clarifiers over a nearly identical weir wall to the primary clarifiers and moves on to the disinfection process. At this point, 85% of all organic matter is removed from the water and the effluent should be safe to drink in most cases, although you probably wouldn't want to. Disinfection is the final step of the process and is usually accomplished in one of three ways, either through chlorine, ozone, or ultraviolet disinfection. Each process has its benefits and drawbacks, with each being used commonly throughout the wastewater treatment process across the world. Chlorine disinfects the water through chemical disinfection. Chlorine, which you can think of as concentrated bleach, is added to the effluent here to kill off any remaining bacteria and organisms still living in the water. When chlorine is added to kill off the bacteria, it then has to be removed before it can be discharged as to not kill off anything in the discharge location. After this, the water is safe enough to discharge into a stream or lake. Ozone disinfection is another method of disinfection that involves pumping an electrical current through the water that causes oxygen molecules, O2, to disassociate and combine with a free oxygen molecule, forming O3, known as ozone. Ozone is an incredibly strong oxidant and causes microbes' cell walls to leak, rapid cell decomposition, and overall damage to cells. In other words, it kills off bacteria. The last common method uses ultraviolet light to scramble bacteria's DNA so that they cannot multiply. 
In UV disinfection, the bacteria in the water aren't killed, rather they're sterilized, rendering them harmless. If you were to ingest water with living microbes immediately following UV treatment, any harmful bacteria would be unable to multiply or render your body damage. Engineers choose between these methods based on a variety of factors such as flow rates, cost, and location of discharge, which brings us to the final step, effluent release. Effluent release exists in one of two forms. In most cases, the now-treated water is released back into a stream or lake or other water source. In rare cases, usually in areas where water is scarce, the effluent discharge from a wastewater treatment plant can be discharged into another treatment plant directly where it will be treated further for consumption. This is referred to as full cycle water reuse. From a chemical perspective, the final drinking water is the same as normal treated water that flows through your pipes now. But due to the connotation of your drinking water being sewage just days before, this treatment process is normally shied away from or not heavily publicized. The entire process of wastewater treatment takes on average 24 to 36 hours from when a drop of water enters to when it leaves. Each wastewater plant will receive a permit for flow rates, chemical levels, and effluent quality, among other things, from the EPA that outlines the necessary treatment for a plant. Wastewater plant operators will make adjustments to a plant's operation and constantly measure levels to ensure proper discharge and proper treatment. Without these operators and the dirty job that they do around the clock, our sewage would always stay sewage and sanitation in modern cities would be much, much worse. Wastewater treatment is an essential dirty job and you can thank the 14,748 treatment plants in the US alone for not having to worry about what happens when you flush. Okay, so I think that's a very nice uh, summary of uh, of how we treat the water in modern times, right? How we treat the wastewater, especially. Yeah, so um, let me just share back my screen. Well, so I think this video pretty much covers the steps that we're going to learn about uh, for the wastewater treatment process. So here, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce the setups, right? So, and their functions for a, a municipal wastewater treatment system, okay? So generally for the larger uh, chunks of the waste, right, in the wastewater, we're going to use screens. So this is similar to the drinking water treatment, where you can have the screens with different mesh sizes to remove those larger particles, right? Or larger chunks of uh, materials. And then for the smaller ones, uh, we could have the grid chamber. So um, the grid chamber, what it does is that it's going to spin the water to let the water to recirculate in the channel, right? So if you have this rotational movement of the water, then it's like a, like a dryer or a washer that you use at home, right? So the particles are going to get spinned onto the wall. So in this case, you can further remove the particles in the, in the, uh, in the wastewater. And further for the, um, let's say the remaining particles, we could have a primary cl clarifier. So what the clarifier does it's similar to a sedimentation basin, okay? So it just let the particles to settle down based on gravity, okay? So there we can do some calculations regarding the designs of these clarifiers later on. And so basically after these primary treatments, or after these treatments, we're going to deal with the chemicals in the water, okay? So mainly we're targeting at the biological oxygen demand materials. So there we're going to introduce the aerated uh, methods, right, to introduce bubbles into the um, uh, aer aeration basin, right, the aeration tank, right. So in that case, uh, we can use the bacteria to uh, compose, right, to, to use or consume all of these organics in, in there. So we're going to deal with the biological treatment to um, uh, remove these BOD in the water, right. And eventually, we can add a disinfection stage, right, to remove those um, uh, microorganism in the wastewater, right? So to basically further purify the wastewater, okay? So these are the steps that we're going to go through uh, in this, I would say this quarter of the semester, right? So here I have a uh, schematic diagram of a general wastewater treatment facility. So uh, basically uh, when we have the raw sewage, right? This is coming from the uh, residential area or the and the industrial area. So they can go through the screens, right? To remove the larger chunks of materials. For the remaining ones, if they are still large in size, we can use what we call the comminuter. So 
So the combinator has a lot of blades on these cylinders. So what they do is that they're going to uh, basically rotate, rotate right against each other. So they're going to crush all of those solids through this gap here so that we can tear these remaining particles into smaller ones. So once they uh, exit through the combinator, they will go to the grid chamber. So inside the grid chamber, there is this rotational movement of the water so that you can spin those particles onto the wall and further get them collected. So for the remaining particles in the water, we're going to send them into a primary clarifier. So inside the primary clarifier, we have this uh, settling of the particles to remove them, right? To, to basically let them settle down onto the basin here. And for this treated water here, then they will further exit and then go into an aeration tank. Okay, so inside the aeration tank, we will uh, introduce a lot of air inside, right? To introduce a lot of oxygen. And at the same time, we have the bacteria inside. So you can treat it as the, the bacteria can have a, a buffet, right? A limited food, right? So they can populate themselves, right? And then use all of those um, organics inside, right? And then remove the BOD in the water. So after that, we'll send the treated water into a secondary clarifier. For the secondary clarifier, we mainly want to collect all of those populated bacteria, right? To let them settle down and also the remaining particles in the water. And then after that, the treated water will go through disinfection to further purify it, to remove the remaining microorganisms inside. Um, so furthermore, if you notice this, uh, this uh, brackets here, okay? So we also divide them into the primary treatment and secondary treatment. So you can see that primary treatment mainly deal with the, phys the physical, uh, the, the physics of the water, right? So we basically block them or cut them or spin them or set, let them settle down, right? So these are the physical processes. And it's also called the primary treatment. And in terms of the secondary treatment, the secondary treatment mainly deal with the BOD, that deal with the chemical species in the water. So if you recall earlier, when we talk about the EPA regulation, uh, says that for all the treat wastewater treatment facility, it has to contain a secondary treatment process, right? So if you recall in here, right? So for the federal regulation, we need to include the secondary treatment, which is talking about removing these BOD in the wastewater, okay? So there's a, um, basically, this is where the water will go through. So what about the solids, right? So for the solids, you can see that for in the grid chamber here, pretty much we have all the larger chunks of solids, right? So these are the, the ones that we cannot use. We can just directly dry them and then dispose them, right? So the same thing for the primary clarifier, we can collect them and then go to the sludge treatment and just dispose them. But there's one more thing that we need to notice. So basically in the aeration tank, we need a lot of bacteria inside. So where do these bacteria come from? right? It has to come from the natural environment, right? So one thing we know is that while these bacteria are consuming all of those organics in the tank, they also populate themselves. So that's why in the secondary clarifier, we could collect a lot of these solids in there. And if you consider, if you think about the composition of these solids that's collected by the secondary clarifier, you imagine that it's basically a lot of um, bacteria inside, right? So that's why we also call these solids as the activated sludge. So we call we say it's activated mainly because there are um, there are a lot of these microorganisms or bacteria that we need that can consume these organics. So that's why for this activated sludge, we're going to split it. A fraction of it will also go to the disposal, right? But a fraction of it will go back to the aeration tank so that we can have a highly concentrated bacteria that we can send into the aeration tank. So in this way, we don't need to always, um, let's say extract the bacteria from our natural system, right? So we can just use what's um, getting out of the waste, right? To send it back into the aeration tank to uh, deal with the organics inside. So this is a secondary treatment. And we normally treat this, uh, uh, disinfection process as the ter tertiary treatment, okay? So that's outside the secondary treatment. So basically in this class, we're going to mainly cover the primary treatment process and the secondary treatment process. And there will be some calculations involved in designing the uh, wastewater treatment facility, okay? Um, so further, uh, there are steps regarding the disposal of the sludge, right? 
So, so for example, for the sludge that we got at the end of uh, uh, these uh, primary clarifier and secondary clarifier, we should further thicken it to remove the water inside, right? Stabilize it to deal with the um, basically the organics uh, uh, or the organisms inside, right? Dewatering, and then there's a final disposal. So we could use them for fertilizer. We could directly uh, go through incineration because most of them are organics, right? Or we could directly uh, just bury it, right? Through the landfill. Um, so further for the industrial waste, uh, uh, wastewater. So basically to prevent the, uh, the, the wastes that's coming from the industries and further impact the wastewater treatment plant performance. So typically for the industries, they will also deal with uh, or add a few steps of the pretreatment. For example, the pH adjustment, organic matter removal, or the toxic material removal before we send these wastewater into the uh, wastewater treatment plant and further deal with the other chemicals in there. So these are the pretreatment processes that the industry will use. Um, so we're uh, so next class we're going to talk about the, these uh, on-site treatment systems. So I think maybe this class we can just end a little bit early. Okay. So you all have a nice spring break, and uh, um, I don't know. I don't think we have homework. Uh, for this week. So you guys can enjoy the spring break next week. Okay.